Okay, so now I am going to talk a little bit about when my brother came to live with me and my mom. Um, we had not actually seen him, I think, in years. Uh, we, we only knew how he was doing, um, by phone calls, which was not good. Um, I had a rule of not talking to him, not taking his calls or returning his calls after 5 p.m. because that's when he was drunkest and and it was a, not a productive phone call. He wouldn't remember it anyway and it was, it was toxic to me. So, um, anyway, he, uh, he gets to our house and initially we had the same rule as everybody else. You're going to have to get a job. You know, you're here. This is temporary. This is so you get on your feet. <clears throat> you're going to have to contribute. And get a job. He got here. And. It was. Pretty quickly. Apparent. That he was incapable. Of. He was. So. Uh, it was no wonder he failed. Where he. Was before. Um, if he was in anywhere near a similar state. Um, at this point, it was obvious that he had um, cognitive deficits. Um, like he couldn't think things through. He couldn't follow steps. Um he couldn't make plans. He had a lot of anxiety. Um, especially about being alone. Um, and that his... The drinking and the being glued to our couch was not... A choice. Um, he obviously did not know how to interact with the world at large. There, um, I, it was. Both, and you could see physically, he was very different. Um, retaining a lot of fluid. He said he had a beer gut. It, it was worse. Um, his hands, he had muscle wasting in his extremities. Um, fine, A fine tremor. Just his fingers would just kind of, all the time, his fingers were numb which is a neuropathy that's very common in chronic alcoholics. Chronic heartburn from vomiting so much from while drinking. Um, he sweated a lot. <laughs> and I think that's because he can, he, he struggled so hard to control this disease, this disorder, this curse, um, by drinking just enough that he could do something, 
but it, and that may have worked for him for a while but it wasn't anymore but he was still trying to do that um for example, in, in, in the anxiety would turn into anger. Um, I think he understood that he was cognitively, he had deficits, that his mind was affected. There is no way he could have functioned at a, at a job. We've, we saw that pretty quickly. Um, he did claim to have walk down the street to put in applications um i never saw him do it uh, more than likely he walked to the stores gas stations to buy liquor after all was said and done we we know that he um before and he did go to treatment but there was a before and an after, and they were identical. Uh, we, to talk about the current situation, I have to talk about after he left. And that was, we found out, um, my mother worked from home on the computer she would have earphones on she would be totally engrossed in what she was doing and so i was off to work and he would steal her debit card and pretty and steal the car because he didn't ask for permission and he shouldn't have been driving to purchase alcohol he stole after he left there was like you would look for something particularly our movies we had this place down the street that would buy used dvds for three bucks each two bucks each and they we had we had some that were we, that we watched regularly and then we had some in like on shelves and stuff in the basement um and so he did the ones in the basement and we still to this day we go to get a movie and th there's whole sections gone yes i'm ocd i put my dvds in by genre uh, um our whole genres are missing um and he would you know take three at a time enough to get a little i don't drink alcohol i don't know what size it is like this big and it's like flat like a flask because he could hide it in his clothes and um and it's just a hop skip and a jump down the street um we found just going about our business we found vodka bottles everywhere everywhere um and outside inside under things on top of things in between things um Okay, so some of the things that we would experience that we noticed. Um, here's an example. I was, I don't know where I was. I was not at home. My mom was working. And he decided he wanted to make frozen cookies. I mean, like, refrigerated cookies. Like, you look at the back of the package and it, they're already cut out in their shape. You just put them on the cookie sheet. 
you preheat the oven, put them on the cookie sheet, and put them in the oven. Take them out, and there you go. And he had trouble with that. He could not do that. He could not follow those directions. And he got, when I came home, he was angry um, that one of us wasn't available. He, he wasn't like, he didn't say, I mean, it didn't make his anger and what he was expressing, why he was angry, didn't make any sense. But I know why he was angry. I knew why he was angry. He was angry because he wanted to do this for us as a nice gesture, but he couldn't. And he understood that there was something wrong with his brain. And, and I think it frightened him. And it made him feel insignificant and useless. And angry. And he took that, he took it out on me first for simply not having been there for him to, I don't know, apparently my presence wouldn't have magically have made this very simple process, you know, for a 40 year old man easier. Um, So I think all those emotions were redirected towards us. Um, we we had to. Um, I don't know how many times. It's a blur. I had to call the police on him. He would hallucinate, and I never knew if it was, um, if it was, uh, because he was drinking, or because he wasn't drinking, or because his brain was permanently messed up. Um, or if he was abusing prescription medication. And I don't mean like um, Percocet, Vicodin, those kinds of things. Um, I think he was on some psychiatric meds, but not like uh, Xanax or, you know. Um, I think he was on Neurontin and stuff like that. Baclofen. He was on baclofen for his back. Um, and we would, they were in capsules and we would find powder. So I know he was doing weird things with his meds. Um, I think he was desperate for, um, what is the word I want? You know, to escape his reality, to alter his um, not reality, but just awareness, just anything, because, not because I think he enjoyed the alteration of his reality, I think that he was desperate to not be aware of his decline, because it was frightening. He already at that time been diagnosed with some we don't know to what extent liver failure because he had a bit of a I believe it is called ag agnosia hold on um let's just say um, 
he had I'm not quite sure which he had either he was downplaying to us whatever the doctors were telling him um, because he didn't want us to know how bad things were physically with him or if um, he literally and this is what I think is more the case he could not grasp cognitively where he was at with this physically. Um, because at one point, his the whites of his eyes were yellow. And... I was a registered nurse, so he can't, he can't fool me. Um, I know he would just throw symptoms here and there. I would see things, so I knew where he was at. So he wasn't fooling me, but he really seemed to believe what he was saying when he was saying, oh, yeah, the doctor said I just have a little too much bilirubin in my bloodstream but it's better now and like dude you have liver failure you have ascites expanding ascites worsening ascites you've had you've been treated for pancreatitis you're yellow your are your extremities the muscles are wasting you know your eyes are doing things sort of <laughs> um but i think he truly was um he truly believed the downplay he reported um I never, one time I was there with him for a visit, but I don't, I, I wasn't, uh, I never got to see any of his lab results or anything like that. And I didn't need to, I could see. And, and so my mom and I agreed that there's our first uh, ultimatum of you're going to have to get a job and do these things. We're like, he simply is not capable. But anyway, he would um, have these episodes of agitation and hallucinate and act on the hallucinations. Um, one Christmas, he thought there was a cat in the tree and he was knocking the tree over. And we had to call the police as it a number of times I don't know how many times and and I kind of was like mom um I work in this community and it's a small community and people know me and recognize me for the work I do and I can't have the police over responding you know people I can't have that it doesn't look good professionally and um, we tried to get him put in the hospital or be taken by the, he did get taken by the police finally once and, um, and then he went to the emergency room. I know I'm, it's so many times that it, is a blur. I remember him um, getting upset with the policeman in the handcuffs. I mean, we had three policemen in our house talking him down, and and, and my mom were like, "He's got to go. He can't stay. He's dangerous. He he turned the oven le and left it on." I'm like, "Why is the oven on?" Um, 
just, you know, he would let the dogs out the front door and they'd be missing. So, um, he was upset about handcuffs because he had PTSD and anxiety and and then I remember being in our local emergency room. Were we in our local emergency room? No. No. I, d I think we... No, we were... He was getting VA benefits at this point. Yeah. So, um... So I think that's where we must have been. Because I, I don't remember it looking like our local unless he went from our local to the VA. And we're begging this woman, you know, because he started to act better there. And we're begging them, he's got to go into treatment, like, now. He has to go into treatment from this point. He can't come back home um from here but they don't have a bed they have a waiting list so he was put on a waiting list and um and we took him home reluctantly And I remember we had a conversation with the police. Can we kick him out? We weren't allowed to kick him out. He'd been there for two we over two weeks, so it was his residence. And we're like, he's dangerous. Um, he's not capable. He can't care for himself. We can't care for him. Um, and they're like, there's no reason for us to do anything. And... It was very frustrating. Um, you know, nobody had any insurance that he could be on. I mean, he relied on VA. We lived in a rural area, so we had to go to the city to get him. The, like, there was a bus that would come to a city nearby, like half an hour away or so where he would do a telecommunicate like video appointments and get blood drawn and stuff like that. Um, let's see. He did end up going in treatment, VA, inpatient. It was like a dorm. Well, he went inpatient and then he graduated to the dorm um, and he did very well while he was there es especially in the dorm well I mean he did all the you know all the paperwork they give you he participated he really enjoyed well, the sympathy he got for his disorders, and, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying that for a long time, there were people on his back about getting a job and getting your life together when, in fact, he was not capable, and... They diagnosed him with bipolar disorder, which I have. And I truly have like your classic case and was diagnosed in my 20s. I w was not drinking or doing any drugs or anything. Um, I don't know if he had it. I don't know if any of his behavior was mental health related except for the anxiety. I know for sure panic attacks I know for sure um, but a good amount of that was related to alcohol drinking am I going to be able to be okay with the alcohol 
so I can do activities. I mean, you have to plan your whole life. When you're an alcoholic, you have to plan every single day, every single minute. You don't want to drink too much. You don't want to drink too little. And, um, and it's a trap. But it, and it also gave him camaraderie that, you know, he was with fellow, you know, soldiers, VA guys, young and old. He did very, very well. And I think that if he had, um, moved on from the they called it the dom uh, maybe it was like domicile <laughs> i don't know but from the dom which was like this really big college dorm like prison like thing um but i mean when your time's up you gotta go they need that bed. You're doing well. You have to go. But uh, I think that if he had maybe gone to something like a halfway house or a partial patient house where they continued meetings and groups and education and had maybe outings and structure structure and encouragement and s sympathy of knowing what he's going through I think he might still be he could still be alive today um I mean, you have one liver, and when you have cirrhosis, there's stages, but when you blow it, that's, it's gone, and you can't live without it, um, which is very sad. You can't get dialysis for your liver. Um, anyway, he did end up coming back home to us, and on the way home and there, he, oh, he looks so good, oh my goodness, the puffiness in his face, he had the nice oval with jawline was better, his eyes weren't yellow, he wasn't shaking. He wasn't sweating. He was talking more coherently. Um, you know, he could stay on a subject. He was not angry. He was very positive. Um, we thought we had succeeded. We thought from here we can help him. We were thinking he needs to get disability. Um, at this point, and he, we got home, and he didn't even last 24 hours. And he was right back where he was snorting his baclofen, the hallucinating, the dangerous activity. And we said, you just can't be here. You have to leave. You can't come here. You can't come back. I don't remember if he went to the hospital again or went with the police again, but I do know that we said, 
you can't you you're leaving and you're not coming back um i believe he went from there to our oldest brother which is a complete horrible place for him to go because my oldest brother is also has problems with alcohol but he also is has problems with aggression and fighting and drama and he is a compulsive liar um and so while justin was there my oldest brother beat him up more than once and he would call and tell us but we said you can't come back it was horrible it broke our hearts we were we felt disgusting and terrible and guilty and um that was for a while uh he stole his truck the only possession he had left i think he couldn't drive it anyway um the oldest brother stole the truck stole money from him um locked him out of the house and um from there he did he didn't stay there quite as long he would call and tell us about these things and i'm not really sure how this went down but he went he was living in a different state with that brother and he moved into a va apartment housing va housing and so he had this small utility type apartment you know, a little kitchenette couch room for a couch and tv and a bedroom uh, I don't even know if it had a bedroom, but it a very small apartment, VA housing, taken care of, um, which was just a different kind of bad. And I'm going to get to that in the next video, because this is when things decline even worse. He's living alone. And it's just him and vodka. So, um, yeah, so I'll finish in the next video. Oh, J.L. Bean.